Hey, what's happening guys? Welcome back to the channel. The following is an interview I did with Ensign Inouye, absolute legend of the sport. It was a pleasure and honor speaking to him. Enjoy the interview. So yeah, Ensign, um, for me, it's a complete honor. I never thought in 2021, I'll, I'll be speaking to, a, you know, speaking to you. Um, you're an old school, OG vet, absolute legend in my book. So once again, thank you so much for doing this interview. Right on. Thank you, man. Let's do it, man. <laughs> All right, Ensign. So um, let's let's start from the beginning. So um, if you don't mind talking about your first martial arts experience, like what was the first thing you studied? The first thing I studied was actually karate. When I was little, I was like seven years old and uh, lasted about two days. <laughs> because when the one of the teachers was checking my stance, he tripped me. And I, I, from what I remember, I ran out crying. Oh, boy. And said, screw martial arts, man. I'm done with that shit. <laughs> but actually, when I was 16, uh, 15 or 16, we started getting into it because in Hawaii, there's a lot of street fights. Oh, I've heard. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought in order to protect myself in a street fight, I should learn to fight. So I started looking into things. We found Taekwondo. I'm not flexible. Um, I also realized that in a street fight, you're not going to have that much space. Sometimes it's going to be in a library, in a parking lot, cars next mm -hmm. to you. So you can't mm -hmm. really use a lot of Taekwondo. So I went searching a little more. Did some Aikido. Aikido and Hapkido. And for the Aikido, it was really hard because, you know, you Aikido is about yin and yang. You're matching, you know, you're matching the energy with your opponent. So if they come at 90... You Misdirection and redirecting energy, yeah. right? I remember talking to the, the teacher at the time, and he said that you got to learn to harmonize your energy with the opponent. And I was like, yeah, but if I fight the same guy 10 times, I'm going to get their 10, 10 different energies. He goes, yeah. I was like, what the fuck? This is hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> then, and then, you know, the thing also thing he told me was, you know, the best, the way to win of the win every fight is to not fight. And I'm like, uh, mm. sometimes you cannot not fight, you know? So I, I was like, right. I wasn't into the spiritual side or, or, or you know, that, that type of uh, mentality where the, the bigger person wins mm -hmm. because when you're young, you don't really care about that. And, you know, there's so much street fights. It's like, OK, I, I can walk away from some of them and feel like I want. I still feel like a pussy sometimes when I do that. Yeah. But it's like, yeah, I, I, I really wanted to just uh, learn how to defend myself. So I stopped Aikido and then I went into after that, I went into a. Uh, I found Wing Chun and Muay Thai. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, Wing Chun, and Kung Fu. Like, and... okay. Yeah, I felt like, okay, Muay Thai is the distance. And then when you get close, you got the sticky hands for the Wing Chun. And mm -hmm. I thought that that was really effective. But, of course, those two don't have ground. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, didn't think, I didn't think ground was that important, you know, until yeah. one day in the college when I was walking around the college, there was a little table set up and there was a guy a brazilian guy named homo labaros mm -hmm. he was running a video and then i saw the video looked interesting because it was gracie jiu-jitsu in action one mm -hmm. watching street fights and it's like <clears throat> man these, these jiu-jitsu guys are beating everyone up mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i remember seeing Lulu hickson and then i'm thinking okay back in that day yeah the bigger guy was a stronger guy mm -hmm. so i was like oh Lulu hickson shit why are these guys showing this video i mean of course hickson's gonna lose you know because he's so much smaller so mm -hmm, why are you showing this video Watched the video, man, and Hickson got to his back, choked him out. And right Incredible. there, I was, damn, this shit's for me, man. I got to learn this because, you know, being Asian, I'm a lot smaller than people in, in uh, Hawaii. Hawaii has a lot of big boys, so mm -hmm. I'm a lot smaller. So I was mm -hmm. like, damn, I got to it. And believe it or not, at that time, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu was a non-credit course in the University of Hawaii. Wow. So I wow, went and I that's said, okay, pretty cool. No Aikido. I stopped the Aikido class and went into Jiu-Jitsu. Mm -hmm. And um, it was funny because the first day in class, they did all this. You, you know, as you know, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu has a self-defense course. Yes. You grab you here, you swing your arm around, you hold here, you know, that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. the first day I went to class, that's all it was. And I'm like, I want to do the shit I saw in the video. <laughs> <laughs> and so after class, I went up to Helsin, Gracie, Helsin Gracie, and I told Helsin, man, you know, I kind of want to spar and feel, you know, the the magic of Gracie Jiu Jitsu because it looks like they beat everyone up in the video. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there was a guy, uh, Jacques Allaire Homero. 
he's like uh, 140 pounds or something. Mm-hmm. At the time, about 175, 180, I was a, a lot bigger than him. And I mm-hmm. did. So it helped him work out Jacqueline Homero. And he goes, okay, so wrestle with him. I'm like, okay, no striking. That's cool. I was just, I'm even ground even easier now. I mm-hmm. can uh, pow- overpower him. So I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, we started wrestling, and fr- frick, man, the guy just took my back, took me mm-hmm. out, and I was like, "Whoa!" I was like, "Holy fuck!" That was crazy. <clears throat> One more time, he had mm-hmm. three chances. I had three chances, and I, every every time the same thing happened. I mean, you know, you know, you know, you, as you know, you know, people who don't mm-hmm. train crazy jujitsu and doesn't understand the movement have no idea. Like a, yeah, uh, fish out of water, man. Fish out yep. of water. So, yep. So, yeah, I try to explain to guys in San, like, not to cut you off. Uh, I mean, like you said, you like either you know or you don't know. You know what I mean? Like, um, it's it's almost like magic. I, I remember the first time I stepped into a gym, it was like the same thing. Like, I, I grew up in New York. I thought I was like a tough guy, been into fights and stuff like that. And um, my first experience with grappling, like, I'm getting tapped out within like 20 seconds consecutively. I'm like, what the heck is this? Like, in the same reaction, like, I have to know this because this is crazy, like, that I don't know this stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing, yeah, how simple and practical it is. Like, why the fuck did I think of that? <laughs> <laughs> so, right there, you know, when that happened to me, um, my whole life revolved around Gracie Jiu Jitsu. I trained every single day. The days that Helsin didn't have class, I would get some of the, you know, the higher belt guys together. We, we train at the studio, you know. Mm-hmm. I was um, jujitsu crazy, you know. I got the I got bit by the jujitsu bug, so that's all I did, man. So, luckily, when I did move to Japan and I decided to try martial arts, mm-hmm. of course, the ground is you know when you're doing MM, um, the volley tudo type of fighting, mm-hmm. you're not. It's not just standing. Majority of the fights on the ground. So, with with the yep. basic, I had blue belt at the time. So mm-hmm. with my blue belt, man, I mean. When nobody knows jiu-jitsu, man, and I you got a crush belt, it. I'm like head over heels, <laughs> technically better than these people. So that's how it happened, man. And, you know, people say, and I think it has, actually is true, I, I actually helped bring Brazilian jiu-jitsu to Japan. Because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the guy who's the head of the federation on Nakai Yuki, mm-hmm. he was my student. I taught him jiu-jitsu. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's a kind of a nice honor to be considered some of the one who brought jiu-jitsu to Japan. That's amazing, Ensign. Absolutely, yeah. He was you now here. And I would say, um, like, one of your most famous submissions when you tapped out Randy, like, wasn't that with an arm bar? Yeah, that was pure jujitsu, man. Yeah. Pure yeah. jujitsu. Yeah, amazing. So would you say that's your, is that your most, the art that you're most passionate about, Ensign, like grappling and Brazilian jiu-jitsu, jiu-jitsu in general? Well, you know, my, 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 uh, my base is jujitsu. Mm-hmm. So more than my, my, my favorite or my passion, I think it's a, what, what I believe I can teach properly. Mm-hmm. You know, I can strike. I learned to strike, but I'm mm-hmm. a striking coach. So I'm not mm-hmm. about to, you know, try to teach people striking because I feel that I'm not, I'm not proficient enough mm-hmm. to be able to teach, you know, mm-hmm. I would, I would like a teacher that can do shit to teach me shit. You know, I, I don't yeah, want yeah. someone that do it. They can teach. I don't want to be that person. So I really go deeper into the ground. I, I'm real confident on the ground, and I believe I can teach anybody. To I can so anybody can learn from me on the ground. Mm-hmm. But um, as far as the standing, I take them to kickboxing gyms. Yeah. I seen um some of your um instructionals online and since some of your coaching it's it's phenomenal it was very technical. Uh, one of the ones I was watching was uh you teaching how to secure an armbar, and you you were showing how like you like to have that outside arm free so like hit them in the face, and then you know like use your body instead of trying to go arm for arm is more of like core against their arm. So yeah, um, yeah you're you're pheno- you're phenomenal. So whoever's under you like lucky them. Thank but you. um, Thank you. Appreciate yeah, totally, Ensign. Um, so Ensign, how about your first uh mixed martial arts fight? Like, what was that experience like, and how'd you even get into that? Like, what ha- what was the story with that? So the ma- martial arts. The reason why I got into martial arts is a real interesting thing because a lot of people get it today because of the money or the fame or you know they want to beat people up. I I 
got into martial arts because I wanted to learn how to control my emotions. Mm. My whole main objective was to become a stronger man so that no matter what situation it was, I could control my emotions and, and protect the people that I love. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I was little, I remember, I remember vividly seeing a show where the guy was driving his family in a car and when he g- got into an accident, rolled down a, a little gully, his car was um, upside down, mm-hmm. caught on fire and he was supposed to get his family out. And the, the, you know, the door was fine to open, but because he was so panicked, he couldn't open it. Mm. It's the same door he's opened a million times, but because it was upside down and the state of mind that he was in, he, he was pulling on the door and he couldn't open it. The family died. Oh my goodness! Uh, yeah, so for me, I, it's just I felt like, um, you know, I've seen shows where people are bleeding to death and the the the, the person screaming, they don't know what to do. Instead of starting a tourniquet, you know, mm-hmm. you could think level-headed in extreme situations. I feel I'm I'm more of a I'm I'm a better person to be able to you know protect and help people. That makes total sense. And like, what's a higher pressure pressure situation than an MMA fight? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, I, I was a racquetball player before, and then you know, when you when you play racquetball, you practice a shot. You can hit it. You get it to a point where you can hit it ninety nine percent of the time. Mm-hmm. But when there's a crowd, when there's you know the the anxiety, and then there's a referee and the spotlight, and you're playing in a three wall glass court. All of a sudden, mm-hmm. the percentage goes close to like fifty percent. Like half the time, yeah. you get the city. And it's not because I'm shitty; it's because I cannot keep my mechanics because I'm nervous or I'm. My footwork isn't there, right? Because Overthinking. Of yeah. So if you can control the emotions and be practice ensign can be tournament ensign. I felt that that was the best thing to do. And like you said, man, what other? What's the best way in life to go to extreme situation than MMA, man? You know what I mean? <laughs> Racket ball. Yeah. So the guy's not trying to hit you with the ball in the face. He's not trying to knock you unconscious. He's just trying to beat you in points. Yeah. So the the the, the reason why I found out that you know. Could to, to practice controlling emotions, uh, MMA would be the best is because Rocky Boy got to a point where I could probably hit, you know, in practice, I hit 90% of the shots good. I could mm. do it like 80% of the time. So I felt my emotions was really good under control in, in mm. Rocky Ball. Mm. So when I went to um, watch Hickson, you know, I knew Hickson, I, because training with Helsin, I knew Hickson really well, like as a personal, as a, like a personal friend, not like a acquaintance. It was more of a friend. Mm-hmm. So when he fought in Japan, he got me tickets. Actually, Hickson is the one who got me tickets to go watch his gym fight. When I went to watch him fight, I mean, watching a friend fight in the ring, I couldn't control my emotions. When he mm-hmm. when he beat David Luvecki, which is like almost like uh, 60 pounds heavier than him, I remember jumping up on the seat screaming. And I was like, oh, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> That's not, I, don't, I don't do that. I cheer quietly. But I got so excited that I jumped up on the chair and i'm thinking wait a minute if i can't control my emotions watching a friend fight can you imagine how hard it'd be to be the one in the ring mm-hmm. and that's when i had a quest of you know um trying to find a a way to get into the professional ring you know it's, it's like when, when you got the objective of the sport to knock someone out break his arm mm-hmm. the anxiety level is huge so I thought, man, I don't know. It could be amateur. It could be any ring. I don't need a crowd. It's somewhere that I can experience getting to ring in a man-to-man combat. So I went on a quest to find that. Called uh, Pancreas. I called Rings. And they, they both were really um, proper. They said, oh, we have a day that we do testing for new guys. You know, they do make them do squats, push-ups, see what, what, how strong they are, what they can do. So I was okay. They said, send in a uh, res." with a profile picture of full body and half, you know, waist up. So I did mm-hmm. that. I sent it to ring, sent it to Pancras. And as I was waiting for them to respond, I called around more. I called UWF. I don't know if you know what UWF is, but it's a pro wrestling association. Mm-hmm. It looks like real fun. So I called them. They said, oh, how old are you? How tall are you? I'm like, why the fuck does that matter, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I realized, ah, pro wrestling, that's why they want someone big and look, look good, strong looking. So I said, okay, forget that. I called Shuto. When I called Shuto, I think, in a sense, because they were so unorganized, they were straight up like, ah, come down, check us out. And I was like, holy shit, I'm going tomorrow. <laughs> just like that. Yeah, just like that. So I went down to the gym the next day, which was about an hour in the bullet, bullet train. I rode the bullet train for an hour to get to them. Mm. So the bullet train got them and 
I walked in the, the gym and had uh, the, the first Tiger Mask, Sayama Satoru, he was there. And he was talking with a couple guys. They turned towards me. I said, oh, hi, Minson. Uh, I did Gracie Jiu-Jitsu before. I'd like to, you know, see if I can do an amateur fight or worst scenario, maybe be a sparring partner for some of your big fighters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, come come to the gym. Can you spar with somebody? I said, yeah, I'll spar with whatever. So they had a little guy in, in the gym, a small guy, like like maybe like 60, 65 kilos, so about 130, 140 pounds. Mm. And they said, uh, how don't you spar with him? I said, okay, so I sparred with him. And I was like, man, this guy's like a fish out of water. I'm sweeping him, I'm mounting him, you know, taking his back. And after the sparring, we sat down and uh, the, the the owner, Sayama, he kind of looks at the guy and he goes, man, we can use this guy in Japanese. He said, you can see, I'm thinking, use this guy. What are you talking about? <laughs> then Sayama looks at me and goes, hey, um, three months, I want you to make the pro, the pro debut. I'm, 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 and I'm straight up like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I just want to experience. I'm not talking about pros. <laughs> goes, no, no, don't worry. Don't worry. You're okay. And later on in the in the as the training went on, later on, I found out that the guy that I sparred was Nakai Yuki, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. one of the one of the big names in Japan. So, uh, you know, as far as how I got into it, that's how I got into it. I had three months trained every day, and um, I remember, you know, like street fights are street fights. You know, street fights are a little different because it happens like that. You have no mm -hmm. time to get nervous. You have no time for nerves, mm -hmm. and you're used. To angry when you get into a street fight so that anger takes over so it's not that hard to street fight mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. the you know the ring it's like fuck you got three months to you know, oh yeah you know, the anticipation the anxiety nerves, the nerves are nuts yeah so in my first fight it was really interesting because i you know learning gracie jiu-jitsu you know mount is the one of the most optimal positions mm -hmm. and you know my mm -hmm. image when i saw the videos of gracie jiu-jitsu they got the mount and just pummeled the guy so in my fight, took the guy down, my first fight, and got to mount. And, man, you know what was really weird is I was mount punching him. Of course, he was blocking and trying to move, but I was catching him some good ones. But, man, I started getting tired mount punching. Mm. I was like, holy shit, mount punching isn't what I thought it was. I thought it was you get on, you just rain down. Smash. Punching. Yeah, but, man, it was like, holy shit, when the guy's moving, the guy's blocking, he's covering up. And then you're throwing punches. It's like you start getting tired. And so it was a it was a big eye opener for me. Mm -hmm, and I was mm -hmm. like, oh shit, you know, you know, I can't just go nuts when I get the mount. I gotta still be level headed. I still gotta choose my punches, and I gotta be smart. So mm -hmm, that was mm -hmm. a really interesting thing for me. That was an eye opener when I first fought. I, the image that I had, you know, I did been in a lot of street fights, and shit, you know, street fights don't last more than thirty seconds. <laughs> yeah, but somebody then the friends break it up, the cops come, you know, something happens where it doesn't mm -hmm. go that long. So yep. it was an eye opener. It wasn't the mount wasn't as easy to finish people that I thought. You know, it, it was a, a great learning experience. Mm -hmm. Um, Ensign, how about the cardio and the conditioning? Were were you um shocked like by how much conditioning cardio you need for like a fight? Like for yeah, you, I was that like a about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was I was shocked about that. And the thing that I also realized is that controlling your, your anxiety is is actually what stamina is about. Yeah. Because, because I believe that you know you, you get stamina. If you get a the more you the more cardio you do, the bigger your stamina tank is. Mm -hmm. you, you know so if I if if I got one this big and another guy got one like this big, you know, twice as big, you know. He has a, a bigger amount of stamina, but if he goes at 110% and I go at 110%, mm -hmm. we're going to run out of stamina at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's just because he has more, he's going to have a better, better movement until the stamina runs out. So it doesn't mm -hmm. mean he's going to last longer because if he can't control his emotion, he uses 110% of it. It's just going to be a, a, a more vigorous, a more aggressive movement for that time. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I, I realize that, you know, you know, you have guys like Roy Nelson that are really out of shape, but they, they don't get tired. And, and this is why is because they know how to control their emotions. They don't exert 100%. They stay at 70, but they can mm -hmm. continue to stay at that level. 
So I realized that, you know, the controlling your emotions is also a part of stamina, man. I mean, if you can't control it, then no matter how good shape you are, if you use 100% is 100%, whether it's a big tank or a small tank, it's 100%. You go 110, you're going to run out of, of stamina the same amount of time as this guy with a smaller tank, but you'll have a better, if you say 10 minutes it'll run out, you have a better 10 minutes than the other guy. So I realized that, and you know, that controlling the emotions is everything, and I was on a mission to do that, and I was on a mission to find someone that would smash me to not mm -hmm. just the stamina wise, but also my heart. You know, um, mm -hmm. when you're in that, you know, a lot of people say that I'm, I'm willing to die for the sport. I want, I want to be champion. But mm -hmm. man, you know, when you get into that point where you can, and it's, it's like fuck, something bad's going to happen if I continue. Mm -hmm. That's what. That's the breaking point where you, you all of a sudden it's like. Oh, in the jacuzzi drinking a coke saying yeah fuck, i want to drink till i die i want to die in there i want to be the champ but when that shit happens man 99 percent of the people all realize like holy fuck i do not want to die and you know for me it was a finding someone that would put me in that position or to break me because i feel like if i get i can learn to be stronger so it was really different back in the day because we're martial artists and not sports or entertainment people we're, in, we're i'm not going to talk shit just to people want to watch the fight i'm not going to you know hype up the fight i, I mean if my per natural personality hypes up the fight that's how it was so for mm -hmm. me it was you know i you know you see nowadays the fighters pick fighters and say i can beat them in the first round it's like mm -hmm. I, I don't think i've ever picked a fighter thinking that every fight Fighter that I picked, I thought would break me, and I wanted to test myself in there and see if I could, you know. So if I felt like, oh, I want to fight that guy, I can do that. I, I don't want to fight him. I want to so waste the time. That yeah, me. that would make me cool. Yeah. So you know, it was a little different. You know, a lot of times you say a lot of my fights is like, why do you fight those type of fighters? Why do you continuously in a row fight? Um, Nagara, he, he's hearing to Nagara from Boma Chanchi. You know, he's like, why do you do that? And the people, John McCarthy actually came up to me one day and I saw him and he said, man, do you ever take easy fights? You got like all <laughs> your fights in a row, like crazy fights. And they say, like, I didn't have time to explain to him that, you know, what my, you know, my objective in the, the sport is to become a champion is to test myself and, and, and be able to learn how to, you know, you get broken in something, you might not continue, but if you get broken, you got that experience, you can, you can be from it, yeah. So I was trying mm -hmm. to find someone that could break me. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, the quest was like that the whole time. And, you know, when I retired, it wasn't because I was, my body was broken. It wasn't because I didn't like the fighting. I loved it. But I retired because I, after the Igor Bovachanchin fight, I didn't think there was any more guru of a fight that would would test my heart mm -hmm. ego was a savage as bad as it was yeah and, and, and then when i lost to him it, i and not one moment in the fight did i think that oh fuck i'm, I, I'm scared i want out of here mm -hmm. my, my heart was strong my body was broken but I, my heart was ready to go right there i felt anything more severe than this i'll probably die so mm -hmm. i felt like man this is like most one of the most severest punishments that anyone in the sport has ever taken. I mean, I had a swollen brain, I had a broken jaw, I had a perforated eardrum, I had a broken finger, and I had the liver count two thousand times the normal person. I was in intensive care for two days. So oh, right there, you know, I thought that you know, I there's not not much more the ring can teach me to be a stronger man, and that's when I decided to retire. I mm -hmm. felt like there's nothing more to ring. Yeah, you were you were known to be basically you know, you know, you know, um, another, another reason why I retired was I don't know if you can actually imagine this, but imagine accepting in your heart that tomorrow when you go to the gym you're gonna die. Uh, most people will avoid the gym, knowing that they're going to die there, that there's a possibility that they're going to die there. But, you know, I had to train for three months to prepare for that moment when I'm going to, in my heart, accept the fact that I'm going to willingly go into that, that might be where my life is going to end. And I, I, I 
live my life like that. I lived it every day at training. I before I went drove to the arena, I prepped my life like that. I wrote notes to people that I wanted to say goodbye to. I literally lived that. I let I was gonna die in the ring. And if you can find a another a video that has my ring entrance, any video, and with this in mind, watch me walk down the ring and think, fuck Ensign right now in his head is walking to a place that he accepts in his heart that he's going to die. Man, it's hard to explain the stress and anxiety that you feel. I mean, you accept it in your heart. Not not just, not just talk and say, oh, I'm willing to die. Anymore. No, no, I accept it in my heart that this, you know, people would ask me, like, if I fought on the 20th of the month and they tell me, hey, we got a big party on the 23rd, come check it out. I'd be like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be there. I don't have any, man, wouldn't that be a while? wonderful day when I'm driving to the party that means I didn't know but it was it was that severe and when I felt that I didn't have anything else to learn in the ring I also felt that man and I don't know if I can freaking take this stress anymore I mean I fought what how much times did I fight I don't know 20 something times man can you imagine that I mean thinking that you're gonna die 20 times and you gotta go through that you know when I went you know when I Arena, win or lose, you know what my feeling wasn't. Fuck, I'm still alive. Holy shit, this is a good day. Wow, wow. Win or lose, man, I was still alive. You know. Yeah, I mean that's part of yeah, your yeah, legend. Yeah, it's my fault for. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what actually made me who I was and made me fight who, how I fought. So, although the stress was high and you know it creates a short career because of the, you know the, the anxiety you have to go through. I mean, I, it's so cool because, I mean, some of the young people don't know who I am, but it's so cool that until today, the fans still remember me, man. Mm-hmm. You know, we're training at, we're training at, we're training at uh, Extreme Couture to, uh, in Vegas now, yeah? And it's so funny because I saw Ryan Couture in the, in the, in the office. I think he's the one who manages the gym. Mm-hmm. So I went in, went in the gym, went in his office and I said, hey, are you Ryan Couture? He goes, yeah. Yes, I said, oh, right on. Just, uh, my name is Ensign, and I just wanted to say, tell you to say hi to your father. And he kind of looked at me like, oh, okay. And, I, and right then I realized that uh, Ryan doesn't know who I am. He has wow. no idea who I am. So wow. I, I didn't say anything. And until today, I think Ryan doesn't know who I am. So even mm-hmm. today after training, he was in the office, and I just kind of stuck my head and said, okay, see you later. And he, he thought I just was like another training training guy or member or something. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you know, guys like Ryan, Ryan Couture don't even know who I am. I we I, kept, I talked to Kevin Lee at the training. I talked to Kevin Lee at the training, and you know, he 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 was he's super cool, man. He he helped out. He trained with my my boy Siyoshi. I mean, super nice guy. So when mm-hmm. he came and started talking, uh, I told him, you know, if you ever come to Japan. Let me know. You know, if you need a gym to train, you can train at my gym. <clears throat> he goes, damn, I really want to go to Japan. I said, okay, and I said. He said, well, if you do want to come, and re- look me up. And I said, my name is Ensign Inouye. And he goes, oh, Ensign Inouye. Okay, okay, I'll look you up. And I was like. Oh, my Lord. Are you, <laughs> oh, my goodness, Ensign, are you serious? So, so, so today, right now, it was just today. And I, I could tell by oh, the way Kevin God. was talking. And he, didn't, he didn't know who I was. And you know what, man? That, that's cool, you know. I, I'm not going to be like, oh, you don't know me. You know, it's like. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. I don't know you, man. But you don't know me. Uh, I don't expect him to know me. Because but the, my, the my crazy was 2013. The crazy thing, Ensign, not to cut you off, is like you are you're a pioneer. Like you're a legend of the sport. Like you paved the way for all these new guys. And um it's cool that you, you don't really get upset about it and you're really humble about it, but that's just wild to me, to be honest. But you know, this is interesting. You know You know what's real funny? Even uh, Walt Harris, uh, that guy's such a nice guy. He help, He's helping to work with Siyoshi. And mm-hmm. he's, I, I'm not sure if he knows who I am. Latifi came up to me saying, man, you're an inspiration. Uh, I, I, I was starting to fight. you. I looked up to you. And Latifi was cool. Mm-hmm. Eric uh, Nixick, you know, the, the head coach, mm-hmm. he like came up and said, oh, it's an honor to me. Just so you say, it's funny that the 52-year-old jiu-jitsu coach, um, What's his name? Uh, Chad, uh, Chad, Chad, something in uh, in the. 
he, he came up and said, man, you're in a, you know, I like it's, it's funny because all the coaches, are, but the, the kids in the gym, have, they have no idea who I am. That's just wild. That's just <laughs> wild. Kevin didn't know who I was. Like, oh, I thought Kevin would know who I was, but, you know, it's no big deal. It's kinda, I kind of chuckle over. It's kind of nice yeah. to be a nobody and to come up mm. and just, just, you know, don't really pay attention to you sometimes. It is. Pretty nice. <laughs> yeah. But it's crazy, Anton, because even some of the guys that came, like, a little bit after your era, like, um, even guys like um, GSP, they're kind of being, I wouldn't say like forgotten, but like some of the newer generation, they don't really know how good some of these guys were. So like they focus more on the new fighters that there's a lot of great fighters, but it's like the guys of the past were like pioneers and amazing as well, you know? So, yeah. You know, you know uh, as much as it's kind of a bummer that I can walk in the arena in America and no one will recognize me or say hi. The you know when I was in Japan or in Japan, GSP, you know. When I went to the one of the press conferences in Vegas about five years ago, Forrest Griffin came up and said it's an honor to meet you. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Nick Diaz came up to shake my hand to say, "Oh uh, yeah, of course, you. Nick. He's a martial artist." I went to a, a, a event in uh, Portland. I had a little a little MMA event. Tito Ortiz was a special guest. He's getting mob with autographs no one comes to me and i'm like oh this is nice man i mean it's like cool i can just do whatever no one's watching what i eat and you know like in japan they, they notice what i eat so I, I become careful what i eat and what i do in japan and people are always watching me keto gets in the ring to make a speech and after his speech you know what he says mm. man you guys i don't understand you guys mm. right in front here is someone that i look up to and is a legend and he a legend. Me, i'm like man nobody nobody knows me here but you know what the Having someone like Tito say that, having Forrest Griffin come up to me, Nick Diaz come up to me, GSP come up and want to shake my hand. Damn, man, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, totally, Ensign. You deserve that. Um, I, I think you deserve more credit, to be honest. I mean, your resume is like literally with like other legends, you know? Um, you fought Randy, Igor, um, your war with Frank Shamrock. You know what I mean? So, um, and then all the organizations you competed in, Pride, Shudo, um, what am I missing? UFC 13. <laughs> UFC. UFC 13. Yes, yes. Way back in the beginning, you know. Um, former Shudo heavyweight champ. I mean, you've been there and done that, you know. So, but it's definitely different times now, um, which leads me into, like, my next question. Um, like, what are the main differences you see, Ensign, from – Mixed martial arts now to compare to back in the day. I think you touched on it, the trash talk, right? Yeah, well, the, the trash talk comes with entertainment, yeah? Mm -hmm. Back in the day, you know, the, uh, us martial artists were in there to test yourself. You know, it, it wasn't about how many people are going to watch, how much we're going to get paid. It was nothing like that. It was just about, I'm going to test myself against that man. And regardless if it was one person watching, there was 100 people watching. Regardless mm -hmm. if you got paid a hundred bucks or a thousand bucks, you know, it wasn't about that. So we didn't try to sell fights. We didn't act anything out of our original personality. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's, I'm real hypocritical because MMA, I love MMA. Mm -hmm. And when I walked into Vegas and I see freaking um, Wei Lee or Rose, Rose's picture on the freaking billboard, you know, you got Usman's, Usman's picture on the freaking billboard thing. Mm -hmm. When I was a little kid, you'd see like Frank Sinatra, you'd see like Billy Joel, or um, what's that, what's that, uh, you know, these famous singers, you know, on the, on the freaking billboards, and it's like, now yeah. you see fellow, fellow martial artists, people I know, people I'm personal. Crazy, I'm, crazy. Fuck, yeah. Know? I'm not. A, I'm, I'm. I'm hypocritical because I, I'm kind of bummed in a way that it's become from martial art to sport to entertainment mm -hmm. now. You know, mm -hmm. I'm bummed, but I'm in the. As I say, I'm bummed. I'm super stoked that MMA has gotten so huge. Yeah, I do understand that there's a lot of changes that happened in the sport. You know, you know to sell the sport. You know, you got rankings, but all of a sudden, some freaking YouTuber. Will come up and skip all the rankings and fight. You know, I know like someone that can talk a tr talk a lot of trash. Conor McGregor 
we'll skip mm-hmm. all the rankings and go straight to a title match. You know, mm-hmm. that's a bummer in a way. But you know, Dana knows what he's doing, and he's doing it because it'll sell and it'll make them make the sport bummer. grow. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'm bummed about how it's leaving the martial arts aspect of it, mm-hmm. but. I'm stoked at how big it's getting. So, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, it's kind of an iffy feeling I have. Yeah. I mean, like, for me, Ensign, um, I appreciate all the fighters, but I, I gravitate more towards, like, the more humble um, guys that are more centered, like, on the actual art, like you, Fedor, GSP was like that, um, Damian Maya. Um, you know, those are those are kind of more my fighters. Um, the trash talking guys are kind of entertaining. I'm not gonna lie, but I totally get where you're coming from. Well, you know, Sometimes you it's a little much. Of, you got a bunch of them. You got Khabib. You got Chandler. You got Justin Gaethje, Poirier, Max Holloway. They're more martial artists, you know. So there's mm-hmm. a lot of guys like that, and I just look at them. And you know, what's hard for me is to think that. Back in my day, everyone was martial artists, so there was no shit talking unless you really hated the guy. <laughs> so, man, you see him in the bathroom, it's, you just go out in the bathroom. But, um, you know, there are times where the promotion would keep us in separate hotels because they know about the grudge, because they know we're martial artists. And there was no, the grudge wasn't for the show. It wasn't for the fight. It was, I fucking hate you, you know? Yeah. So, you know, you, you and then everyone was like that, so it's easy, you know? But when you got this freaking day and age that mixed martial arts is entertainment, you mm-hmm. got someone like Khabib that's a martial artist, and you got someone that like Conor McGregor that's an entertainer. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mix. Conor's going to criticize his religion, going to mm-hmm. criticize his country. And mm-hmm. if it was for entertainment, ah, he's trying to sell the fight cool. But then you guys got real martial artists like Khabib. You know, it's like, I'm not, I don't care if you're trying to sell the fight. You disrespect my religion. Right. You disrespect my country. It's fucking going down. Yep. So, yep. you know, Khabib's there talking to him, like, man, let's talk now, you fucker. Yep. And after yep. he wins, people are jumping over the ring and fighting you. And uh, a big one that was like, that was really respectful is Ronda Rousey. You know, Ronda Rousey's like that. She's not, there's no entertainment in her shit, you know. And you know, mm-hmm. her and Nisha went back and forth talking shit to each other. And Ronda got a lot of shit because after she beat Nisha, Nisha went to shake her hand and she refused to shake the hand. And people thought, oh, what a fucking poor winner. You know, like, it's like Misha lost and she's shaking her hand. But, you know, for me, I looked at it like, man, Rhonda's true to her word. You know, she's not mm-hmm. playing a game. She's not. Yeah, she didn't like her. Yeah. Okay, I didn't like you. And it wasn't fuck. I don't like you whether you beat me or you, you I beat you or knock you out. I still don't fucking like you, period. You know, it was. Yeah, I got to respect I, that. I, I fucking hate you. I just, and then when the fight's over, oh man, thank you, man. Like, fuck you. I hate you in the beginning. I hate you in the end. You know, it's cool like that. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that, that's, you know, where it's, I, I really um, appreciate the fact, you know, people ask me sometimes that, don't you wish you're fighting now? Because a lot of your fights would have been fighting at night plus 50 grand. Yeah, that looks, sounds good. But you know what, man? I'm really appreciative that I fought in the days of martial art where you didn't have that stress of, guys doing sport shit to you, you know, like Khabib and McGregor, yeah. you know. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I do love the fact that uh, you know, we didn't make money, but we got to test ourselves in a true martial artist way. Right. And, you know, Ensign, with the trash talk, um, it's entertaining, but like how you touched on with the Connor thing, um, some people don't think there's limits. And I'm like, no, there's limits. You shouldn't talk about religion and family. I mean, I'm sorry, like entertainment or not, like, you you kind of cross lines when you do that. That's just how I think, and I know you feel the same way. So yeah, you know, you have something like if there's someone gets into a scrap in the hotel because the guy talks shit about his family, it's mm-hmm. like people nowadays will say, "How fucking stupid!" He lost. He can't fight now because now because they got into a scuffle in the in the in the background in the backstage, the mm-hmm. fight's over now. And for me, I'm like, my my honor and my principle. Way more important than the fucking fight, you know. Fuck mm-hmm. the fight. You're gonna talk shit about me. We're getting it down in the fucking hotel room, you know. Yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's a, a whole different thinking, you know. That, back in the day, that was an honorable thing to do, but now it's like it's stupid. Like suck it up. You guys are gonna fight tomorrow? Why are you? Like John Jones and Cormier got into that little thing. Oh yeah, yeah. It's like fuck. We they're so stupid, you know. It's like they, they they're gonna fuck up the. They're not gonna be able to fight, and they, they should have controlled them. So it's like. Man, it depends on the mindset of the person. If you're a martial artist, man, fuck you, man. You disgrace my honor. Fuck the fight. Fuck the police. We're getting it on, you know? So a little different, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, there's some guys that think just like you. Like, we were just talking about them, the Diaz brothers. Talk smack about those guys and catch them in a hotel. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> you know? Exactly, um, exactly. But, uh, Ensign... Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Those are those guys are like real fighters, you know. Um, there's yeah. a couple of other guys like that. Like um, I think Tony Ferguson is pretty serious. Um, Jorge Masvidal. There are certain guys that if you run your mouth to them, you got to back up what you're saying, you know. So yeah, I agree, man. But uh, Ensign, I wanted to ask you about um, overcoming, um, and you kind of touched on it, but um, how important is like the mind compared to the physical when it comes to like a fight or mixed martial arts, like how did you overcome like fear? Well, the, the first way to overcome fear is to accept that it's something that is always going to come to you, no matter how strong or how tough you are. Fear mm -hmm. is always going to, you know, some fighters say, I have no fear in the ring. It's like, you have fear. Everyone mm -hmm. has fear. Naturally, people don't want to get hurt. Naturally, people don't want to get their arm broke. But one big thing about fear is, accepting fear accepting that you're going to be you know you know is they, like they have like alcoholics you know the first step to to fixing your your problem is to accept that you are an alcoholic you know if you can say i am an alcoholic that's when the, the the thing starts you know if you can say i they do feel fear that's when you can learn how to fight fear mm -hmm. and you know, you know people think that i'm tough because i you know i got my hearing popped my arm and i didn't tap you know igor kept punching and i kept going you know that kind of stuff but you know the mind, this is a good example of mindset. If you're going into, this is a simple one because I think everyone has felt it. If you're going into a store or you're going into a casino and you plan to lose a thought, you say, okay, I, in my in my heart, I accept that I might lose $100 mm -hmm. or $1,000. Yeah. So you're gambling on the table or wherever you're gambling and you're getting to eighty eight hundred dollars like fuck. <laughs> I'm, I only gauge my heart and my plan to only lose a thousand, and then all of a sudden you're at a thousand, you lose that, and you're like, oh fuck! It's so he you're so hesitant to pull out on a hundred because you already set your feeling to that your limit was a thousand, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you got another guy, you know. So so anxiety starts kicking in, and and you're thinking of tapping out and or going back to your room at a at nine hundred dollars because you're. Your mindset leeway is only another hundred, but then you got another guy that goes into the casino and says, "I'm willing to lose ten thousand dollars," and he goes in there and he loses a thousand, which is would create anxiety in the first guy. It doesn't create anxiety because his his set his limit at ten thousand. Mm -hmm. So to to match that in the ring, when I fought, I fought and I was prepared to die. I wasn't prepared to give everything I got until I got choked out and tap off before I pass off. I wasn't planning to give everything I got unless my arm is popping. Mm -hmm. I literally went in the ring planning to die. Mm -hmm. And what helped me with that was one is if you are in your heart, you know, you know some fighters even think that they believe, but in their heart they don't. Whenever they get a pressure situation, they'll tap off, you know. But I believe in my heart that I, I am accepting the fact that I'm going to die today. You know how hard you're trained? You know, if you go up to 10 of the fighters today and say, hey, what if you were going to fight to the death in your next fight? Would you train harder? A lot of fighters will say, oh, shit, yeah, I'd train harder. Like, <laughs> yeah. You're not doing anything you can, you know? So for me, one, one exact, uh, you know, one plus perk to having that mindset is I train fucking hard, man. And then the, the other perk to that, too, is, you know, if you train like the guy who tr plans to lose $10,000, just like I train, I plan to die in the ring. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you hear about um, big accidents like you know, see a, a you know, car accident. Yeah. And then you, the, for some reason, the fair severity of it is, wow, three people in the car accident died. And you're like, holy shit, three people died. And then all of a sudden, you hear about another car accident and say, oh, nobody died. Like, oh. Or oh, the guy might have a broken back. The guy might be paralyzed for life, but nobody died. The severity is there. So, you know, for me, if you're planning to die in the ring and you're, you hear your arm popping from armbar, mm -hmm. are you going to tap? You plan to die. Yeah. I, if, if you hear a car accident and you say this guy died in the car accident, you hear another car and say, oh, the guy broke his arm only. 
Oh, you'd be like, oh, fuck, that's just a minor car accident. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, he's okay. <laughs> yeah, he's okay. Only a broken arm, shit, you know? So mm -hmm. the fact that I could, I did never tap, is it because I'm tough? Is because I did set my mind, mindset was, was straight on, hardcore. I was ready to die. So, you know, broken wow, arm, that nothing. That's some crazy psychology there, Ensign. So you, you set the bar like so high for yourself that getting hurt, losing the fight, that was like inconsequential. You're like, I'm ready to die. So all these other things, not that big of a deal. That's kind of how you dealt with it. Yeah, passing out, my arm popping, my ligaments tearing. Uh, I wasn't thinking about fighting tomorrow. I'm, I was just thinking about, you know, pushing myself to the limit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing with me was really good was winning and losing didn't matter. I mm -hmm. felt like winning and losing was like the tail of a dog. You know, if a, uh, if a dog is walking down the street and you think, okay, when he passes that corner, what side, is, what side, what side of his body is the tail going to be on the right or the left? You can never control that. The dog's mm -hmm. tail might be on the left, the dog's tail. It's like winning and losing. You can't control it. You know, so I, I never did pressure myself. Whenever I had fights, even my student today, Siyoshi, mm -hmm. he doesn't have a win bonus. Mm -hmm. He has one payment. One payment and that's it. You know, win or lose, you don't get paid less or more. You fucking mm -hmm. don't worry about winning or losing, man. That's something that you cannot control. Mm -hmm. The only thing you can control is giving 100%. Your performance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Give everything you got. That's all you can do. If yeah. you win doing that, great. If you lose awesome. doing that, and the guy's a better fighter than you. So be it. You know. I mean. Yeah. Why? Why put more pressure on yourself? Exactly. Yep. Losing. There's no pressure about giving a hundred percent. You know. Yeah. That's why those guys choke. Like you were touching on with the. Uh, it could be any sport. Like um, in the gym, they're amazing. But like under the all the lights and stuff, it could be basketball, anything. They, they're overthinking. How do I look? Am I doing okay? So it's like the yeah. winning and losing. With that psychology, you just remove it. So it's less pressure. Yeah. yeah. Smart so, and so. You know, it wasn't something I planned. It was just my my way I was. You know, I, I, I didn't, when I went, went in the ring, it wasn't a sport. Mm -hmm. It was uh, you. I mean, nowadays it's like even Japan is frowned upon. You know, you know I use the words like, he's coming to kill me. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna kill him before he kills me, and it's like, whoa! Why you gotta get so fucking <laughs> sick? Yeah, it's all PC it's now. That's not a surprise. Yeah, just don't use the word kill. It's like that's how I feel. You want me to lie? Mm -hmm. You want me to use another word that won't? Go, it's not gonna explain my feelings. Yeah, but you could die in MMA. That's the thing. It's not like playing baseball. You know, you're you're right. Yeah. You know, you could die. It's do or die. What the what the the freaking objective of the sport is to knock the guy out unconscious, <laughs> bust his arm. Yeah, come on, man. fuck that, man. I'm gonna fucking kill you before you kill me. Yeah, you know absolutely. I mean? Yeah, hug after. <laughs> yeah, oh, man. exactly. Um, Ensign, I wanted to ask you about um, what are your thoughts on um, a lot of guys training right now? Like they don't, they've cut the hard sparring down, um. What are your thoughts on that? Do you feel like you have to still have some hard sparring before the fights, or do you think it's good that they're kind of a lot of gyms are shying away from it? Well, when you get into that grind in the in the fight, mm -hmm. the best the best way to prepare it is to be able to grind in the gym. I mean, if you're like someone like Max Holloway or the Diaz brothers and they've already been through the grind so many times and they stopped sparring for their health, mm -hmm. they already know what the grind's like, you know what I mean? But these new fighters, man, if the first time you're going to feel the grind is going to be in the ring, that's not going to go good. Mm -hmm. The hard sparring, the getting, taking those shots, those hard spots in their face, you know, getting in that position and getting pounded, you know, it, mm -hmm. is stuff that if you've already been through it once, the anxiety won't take over your, your emotions when it happens in a ring. You've already mm -hmm. been there. It's a familiar situation. You know, it's like you understand it. Like, like almost like something so simple in the casino. If you've been on the blackjack table and the and the pie gal table and the, the, the Texas Hold'em table, you're pretty comfortable. No matter mm -hmm. what happens, you're comfortable. Even if the dealer's fucking, you know, showing a five and then you got you got a two threes and you split it and then all of a sudden a seven comes and you got to double on that and then an eight comes and you got to double that and you got all that you, you understand what you got you've been through it all 
But then if you never played freaking Texas Hold'em and you go up there and you're like freaking playing, the nerves are different, yeah? So you, it's, a, mm-hmm. it's, a real, it's a real different thing if you've been through it, you know? Yeah. So so you're saying like you, you have to kind of experience uh, a little bit of that so you wouldn't be like shocked in a fight, like taking a super hard shot, you know? Yeah, yes. I can see. Yeah, I have to agree with you. I have to agree with you. And um, guys like Max, like you, you know, like you touched on. Um, Max was saying once in an interview, and I think Cowboy said this. Cowboy Cerrone. He said, "Um, I know how to fight. You know what I mean." So you know, he's he was like, "I've been through the hard sparring, so I'm at a point right now where I could just do the conditioning." But but they also went through the hard sparring. So Definitely. yeah, if they they know what it's like. They've been through it. You know. And if they, if they, in their professional career, they have the opinion that they don't need it anymore. Someone like Cerrone and the Diaz brothers, they know, they know that they don't need it anymore, you know. But you got this new guy that's never really fought saying, hey, Max says you don't need to spar. I'm not sparring anymore. It's like, <laughs> yeah. good luck, motherfucker. When you get yeah. in that grind in the ring and you get it in the gym, good luck. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> totally yeah um but you know it's it's the whole thing with the cte now like i understand like why a lot of gyms are kind of trying to shy away from that um because I, I think you probably could get hurt if you're sparring like hard all the time but um you would know better than me ensign but it's it's got to be like a balance right you can't just go hard every day you know yes exactly exactly like like back in our day we didn't even Think about the, the aftermath of the fights and the, you, just, you know the career. We did uh, three times a week, straight mm-hmm. up. Um, we called it volley to the sparring, and it's like straight up, put on the little gloves and pound each other, you know. But mm-hmm. with all the you know, Gary Goodrich, you know, has some problems now with his memory. Yeah, because, uh, you know, other guys have um, you know, Mark Coleman's hips are real bad. I think Vanderlei too. Vanderlei has some issues. Oh, does he? I didn't know that. I think he does. Yeah, I read something that he has um, some like CTE symptoms or issues. Yeah. And then you got Don Fry, man. He can't even lift his arms up because his shoulders oh, yeah. are off. Spinal you know, surgery. Yeah, so you look at that and you know, I believe that we did it a little too hard, mm. <laughs> but I believe you need it. Like, even like once a week. Yeah, yeah. You go yeah. fine. And you, and yeah, you like roll in the fight. You control the kicks like you are in the fight. You throw the punches. You got the guy in the turtle position. You're controlling him, and you throw the ground and pound. Do it like the fight once a week, man. I say yeah. once a week. Fuck you know. That's how That's it was in the gyms uh, that that I was in. Like it was like every Friday was like harder sparring and stuff like that. It was like once a week. <clears throat> But um, on a, on a little bit of a lighter note, Ensign, um, I just got a couple of more questions. You, you've been so gracious with your time. I really appreciate it. Um, what's something that you do for fun to, like, relax, like a hobby? Yeah, this is weird because I have a huge yard in Japan. And me and my wife, we like to, to clean our own yard. And people sometimes tell me, why don't you use a um, get a get a yard cleaner? And then I'm like, oh. Because that's one of my, I enjoy cleaning the yard. I enjoy my time in the yard. Mm. You know, that one of my things that I enjoy, the stress relief is is cleaning my yard. And then the other thing that I really enjoy is um, I race koi's. Okay. If you look to Instagram and scroll down. I have, uh, right now at home, I have about 140 koi's. Wow. Yeah. You, I had six. They bred. I did it to save some. And I have a little over 140. <laughs> Well, if I check the message, I'm on the phone. It's charging. Yeah, so it's like, yeah, if you ask me what, yeah, I mean, I can sit and watch the fish swim around and, you know, interact with each other. Mm-hmm. I can sit like that for hours, man. So that's basically, that's like your zen place. Yeah. And, and my dogs. Mm. Hanging out with them, you know, watching them interact, giving some hugs, you know, I mean, that's my happiness right there. Mm-hmm. that's awesome Vincent. uh for me i think it's like uh i'm big into movies i like watching movies and stuff like that so um books i like to read and sometimes i just like to sit by the water with a coffee and just right. just just sit by the water you know not think about anything in particular just kind of drift off and uh, you know center myself and stuff like that so 
Um, All right, Ensign, who is the toughest opponent for you personally in your career where you're like, they're like, what is it going to take to put this guy away? Like, who is the toughest? I've, I've been asked this question a lot, and I have, I don't have one answer. Okay. Physically tough, where I felt that power was just overcoming, where I was like, fuck, this guy is fucking strong, was Mark Kerr. Oh, this. Technically, technically, where I felt like, holy fuck, I can't create an offense because this guy was aggressing me so much that I couldn't get anything off on my side was Nogara. Mm -hmm. And two two legends right there. And and one that, you know, that I just felt was so awesome because I think he went into with the same mindset of trying to kill me was Frank Mm Shamrock. You guys had a war. We just went toe to toe and, you know, even, even when he need me and I wish it was today because I always have that question, man. What would I, I, I think I could have got up if he jumped at me. I think I could have guarded, put him in my guard, you know, but we'll never know. And I think it's unfair to not just me because I didn't get to see if I really could have continued. It's unfair to him because he got me in that vulnerable position that he could finish me with no question. And then, mm-hmm. you know, the rat, you know, they had that weird uh, 10 count rule, yeah. So when I went down, which I disagreed with, I never mm-hmm. liked that rule. They mm-hmm. gave me like a 10 count and he jumped on me. He, my brother saw that, went in the ring, and, you know, it was a big. big oh, yeah, yeah. Right I remember yeah, that, yep. You know, people ask me about that fight, and, you know, in my heart, um, I he didn't win by DQ. Mm-hmm. He, he knocked me out. I mean, if uh, the rule that I don't like is that stupid eight count. So if Frank had the opportunity to jump on me as soon as I went down, ninety percent of the uh, there's a chance that he would have finished the fight. You know, so I accept that that it wasn't a DQ. It was like it, he killed me. You know, so mm. you know that that was a you know that fight, man. And you, if you watch the video of that fight after that, we kind of hugged each other. He was at the verge of crying. I mean, we just he he put it on. He put his shield out. I put my shield out and. You know, because he was a better man that night. You know, not, no, that's, not, no re- yeah, I mean, that's something special that, like, only you and Frank understand. Something that you guys shared, you know what I mean? Just incredible. That was a war. <laughs> yeah, um, I've seen it. I've seen him since, and we're a totally good terms, man. I mean, I respect yeah. him as a warrior. He respects me as a warrior. That's great. <clears throat> it's awesome like that. That's great, Ensign. Um, Ensign, I just have one more question for you. Um, is there anybody that you're a fan of, a uh, fan of like in today's modern MMA where you got to kind of tune into their fights? And uh, yeah, anybody out there? Fuck, a lot of them, man. Like, I'm so bummed Khabib retired. I love Khabib. I know. I know. Yeah. So dominant. Justin, Jesus. Justin Gaethje, man. I love that guy. Savage. Michael, Michael Chandler. And, you know, you got, um, you know, even like uh, freaking uh, Nungano. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know? yeah. They call him uh, uh, MMA's Mike Tyson. <laughs> I mean, all these guys. I mean, Wei Li, Rose. You know, Amazing. Man, like Ray Lee and Joanna's the fight, man. Holy shit. You know, I, I'm, I'm a fan. And, you know, this weekend, though, tomorrow, I think, they have all those fights, yeah? I, I yep. just, I'm, like, not watching as a fighter. I'm a fan, and I'm super excited. <laughs> I'm looking for it. But, you know, every time, thank you, Dana, but every time there's a UFC, it makes my week, man. I look forward to that to- day. Totally, totally. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm not somebody that thinks, oh, I'm a pioneer of these people, you know, I'm I'm totally like, man, I'm, I'm totally fanboying. I'm excited about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like three title fights this weekend, uh, Ensign. It's, it's, uh, like, it's a huge card this Oh, weekend, my man. goodness. Amazing card. I'm so excited. Uh, Festival, Wei Li, Rose, and uh, Tavenko, and um, what's his name? Uh, Andraj, Andraj. Andraj, yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, man. Do you have any you know, thoughts Shavanko on it? So dom- what do you think, man? Shavanko is so dominant. She's a on, in Vegas now. She's a she's a minus one twenty five favorite. Wait a minute, Valentina's. 
Oh, okay, okay. She's the favorite. I was gonna say she's. The, I misheard that. Twenty-five, only yeah. one twenty-five. She's so freaking dominant. She uh, fought Nunes to a draw. I mean, you yeah. know, Nunes was a good fight. She fought her and twice. She's is strong, but I think Savenko's ground is good. Yeah, yeah. And I'm actually talking to my wife here, thinking, "Fuck, I almost want to go down and put a thousand on a Savenko, man." Yeah, <laughs> she, I think I she's that guaranteed. <laughs> Um, no disrespect to Jessica and Sam, but I like for me that's the more clear cut fight out of the title ones. Like I feel like Valentina is gonna think she's gonna do really well. She's so amazing as a fighter. If um, you had to put all your money on a one of the champions fight, that'll be the fight to put all your. That's money the one. On. That's the yeah. I mean, a draw is a beast, and there's a chance she could beat Vanko. But if you're gonna have to go with the percentages of taking picking a fight in one of those three fights, I think that's your best percentage. Yeah, totally. And I I just think her strike, she's like good everywhere. Her footwork is amazing. I think she's gonna be hard to hit. She's just so freaking good. Uh, what do you feel about Usman and Masvidal? Oh yeah, her ground. She has great jujitsu, defensive wrestling. Oh yeah, man. Usman Masvidal, man. What do you think, Anson? <laughs> I love, I love Masvidal. I just love his attitude and how he's a freaking Me too. gangster. Me too. And yeah. I, I feel that if only because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking consideration the first fight on how it went and how much time Masvidal had to prepare. Mm-hmm. I think that he's got a proper training camp this time. He doesn't mm-hmm. need to cut as much weight. He's cutting weight way better this time. Mm-hmm. I just feel like um, I, I I would pick Massive Bar. Yeah. I, I feel like a lot of people are underestimating him, like big time, you yes. know? Yeah. He's a and fucking gangster. He <laughs> is. He is. And and instant, it's like people get so caught up on records. It's like It's like they act like fighters can't improve. You can't grow. And a lot of his losses are decision losses. Like, Masvidal is really freaking good. He's really good. It shouldn't be a shocker if he beats Usman. Not not, not to me, anyway. So, what about us? Uh, th- um, I, I got Whaley. Like, I love Thug Rose, but I think Whaley's going to win. Whaley, I don't know. Rose is so much technical, but damn, Whaley is like a beast man she's, she's like a, a beast like a cyborg you know <laughs> yep yep yeah she's she's a little dynamo i mean she's crazy um one of the greatest fights ever was her versus uh joanna that was like oh, yeah. <laughs> like <By far>, yeah. <laughs> when i want to like introduce somebody to mma that's like one of the fights i show them like that one um not to talk your ear off and keep you forever but uh, uh dan hooker versus poirier that was another crazy fight. I don't know if you yeah. saw that one. That was nuts. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. it's like, for some reason, man, I guess, the you know, China being like a communist country, it just seems like she's grown up in a harder life. Mm-hmm. She didn't have it as easy as us Americans. You know, Americans, you know, you got our, we got too many fucking rights. You know, we complain right, right. about every little fucking thing. I you know. know. Like, that the Chinese, man. Their government controls them. They're like hard. They're hard, man. They're tough, man. It's like Wei Li is has been brought up different, you know, like yeah. the Russians. Russians are, oh yeah, you know, totally. They've had a hard life, man. Not like us, you know. I mean, Americans just got everything served on a silver platter, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Their, their lifestyle, yeah. So I, I mean, man, how can you bet against someone like that, man? This just stone hard, cold. Yeah, you know? <laughs> I know. She's um. Even at the press conference, like they were asking her like about Rose's comments because Rose kind of got a little personal with her. Yeah, um, she did. She had no reaction. She's like, "Man, doesn't matter. I'm just gonna go fight. That's what you know." And um, yeah, she's a little she robot. Like, she said something like, "Ah, oh, is that how she feels?" Well, she doesn't really understand what my situation. That kind of like straight up, like she doesn't know what she's talking. About. Like it didn't bother her. It didn't like piss her off. It didn't bother her. <laughs> like, yeah, no, not at all. Um, scary. I, <laughs> yeah, it's scary. She, you know, like you said, like Fedor, just like stoic. Uh, but maybe yeah. Rose was trying to um rile her up to kind of throw her out of her game. Who knows, you know? Didn't work, though. <laughs> D- didn't work, didn't work. <laughs> 
But um, Ensign, um, that's all I got. Um, I just want to say that you're a legend of the sport. You're an absolute pioneer. And uh, I want to thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. And um, enjoy the rest of your evening. And um, enjoy those fights Saturday. And also vice versa, me to you. Thank you for what you're doing for the MMA. MMA has made me who I am. And I'm grateful to all of the people who are helping, you know, push the sport and make it the biggest sport in the world. So thank you for what you do. Thank you so much, Anson. Really, really appreciate it. And um, for the fans that want to reach you and uh, see what's going on in your life, uh, where can they reach you at? Like Instagram and... Yeah, Instagram, uh, Twitter, Facebook. I do them all. Um, for some reason, I can't get a blue check. So, oh man, we're gonna have to fix that, Ensign. <laughs> so, I tried Instagram three times already. I, in fact, right now there's one submitted already that I again try. I think you gotta wait three months or something for it to do it again. <clears throat> they sent a picture of my license, you know, and, and kind of requested a blue check and still haven't yeah. gotten it. And I, I, yeah, you, you're I'm too awesome. You, mind, man. You're too hardcore for Instagram. <laughs> it's funny. Oh, man. But we're going to have to change that in. So we're going to get all the fans together and we're going to bombard Instagram. Blue check, damn it. Pioneer. (laughs) Give me a blue check. Blue check to a pioneer legend Instagram. Get it together. Um, (laughs) Come on. Come on. But uh, Ensign, once again, thank you so much, sir.